morning of the first round. Morning of the first round, I head to the course a little bit early to see and walk with some of my FBO friends. <laughs> That's funny right there. What's up, YouTube fam? Robbie C here. I recently had the opportunity to play in the Music City Open, which is a Disc Golf Pro Tour Silver Series, and it was interesting, we'll say. There were definitely some highs and lows, and I wanna take a quick moment to recap the journey and bring you along with it to see if we can learn some lessons together. But before we dive into the disc golf, we have to talk about the week leading up to it because I don't know that a comedy writer could have written something this dark of what transpired in the week leading up to my first disc golf pro tour event. Now I've played a lot of events in the past and I was still pretty nervous leading into my first disc golf pro tour event. And normally I have to deal with a lot of haters in my comments, but this week in particular, there seemed to be a lot more haters than supporters in my DMs and it kind of weighed on me. But regardless, there were still beginners to be taught and videos to be made. So I headed to the course to film and I really uh, didn't like any of the footage I shot. So I went back on Tuesday to reshoot all of it. Footage like always felt a lot better the second time. So I jumped in the car, ready to head off to meet a beginner and a friend for their first round but the universe had other plans. A helpful piece of going places is that your car has to actually start. After a host of electronics issues and waiting three hours for AAA to arrive, I had my day ruined and I had a car that wasn't working. So I did what any rational 29 year old man would do. I went home, ordered some pizza, played with my dogs and played video games, hoping that tomorrow would just be a better day overall. Next day's car still wouldn't start. So I had to tow it over to Firestone. And after a diagnostics text, they told me that everything was fine with the car. And I said, but it won't start. To which they replied, yeah, that's the interesting part. Guess you're gonna have to get it hauled off to the dealership for them to look at it. Which is an epic bummer. So I called the dealership and said, hey, my car's not working. Would you guys be able to take a look at it? Yeah, of course we'll take a look at it. We'll set you up with our earliest appointment, which is Monday, April 11th. Huh, <sighs> bummer. So I had to get a rental, which was gonna cost money. And because of that, I needed to make a YouTube video to help make money because I was about to spend a lot. So I dropped a load of laundry in order to have clothes for my tournament and started editing a video. And that's when it happened. My power went out and it would not return for 24 hours. So Thursday morning, we wake up with no power and head off to pick up the reservation for our rental car. Except they didn't have any cars available. Why do you make a reservation when uh, you don't have any cars to actually reserve? My amazing wife can see the stress overcoming to me and I was this close to just withdrawing from the event and saying like, hey, forget this, life is too crazy. I'm not about to go play disc golf. But like I said, my wife is amazing. She said she'd take care of it and said, just go, enjoy yourself, soak up the fun. So because she's awesome, I did just that. I took her car and headed off to Nashville, Tennessee. Now pro tour events are pretty cool. When you go to play practice rounds, you actually sign up for a specific tee time and tee off then to keep traffic flowing on the course. It worked out to play my practice round with my teammate and friend, Chris Sagone of Perfect Putt 360 and Team Westside. And he brought along an amazing human being, Sarah Hokum, the queen of forehand. Y'all, it was honestly awesome getting to see her and Chris kind of talk about their strategy and game plan to tear up the course. I felt confident in my lines, my putting, my dish choices. And even with this noodle arm, I actually believed that shooting under par was possible on this track for me. Now it's important to mention that my host for the weekend was a guy named Alan, who is a part of the birdie fam and I had met him three weeks before in person and he was super nice and offered to let me stay at his house for free and I took him up on it. But while we were playing the practice round, Alan kept saying that his stomach was hurting him and I thought, well, maybe, I don't know, he just had some like bad food or something the night before. Morning of the first round, I head to the course a little bit early to see and walk with some of my FBO friends. That's funny right there. So like I was saying, I got to the course a little early and I realized I had left my power block at home. I asked Alan to bring it so that I could have it as a backup in case my phone died during the middle of the round and I was doing live scoring, all the things. And that's when Alan told me this. Yeah, Robbie, I'm actually not gonna be able to caddy for you today. I'm on my way to the ER. They're about to take my gallbladder out. I'm so sorry. I hope you feel better. That's terrible. But Alan's a trooper and told me don't worry about it. He was about to feel a whole lot better and then he was sending his nephew Derek to caddy for me for the first round. Because after all of this, y'all, <laughs> we still had to play disc golf on the Pro Tour. <laughs> to say I was nervous would be the understatement of the year, especially when you have an introduction like this. Robbie Crawford! <laughs> yeah. 
I had some incredible card mates the first round in Logan Bowers, GT Hancock, and Ben Calloway. Yeah, with the gallery, walk-up song, them on my card, all the hype, my first putt, my hand was moving about like this. So I walked away from the putt, told myself, you're a boss, Robbie, you can do this, be a boss. Walked right back up to my putt, brought my hand up, it started shaking again, and I said, all right, cool, I think we're just gonna take a part here. I jaspered that first putt right into the cage, and next thing you know, we were off to the races, starting off of the par. I wouldn't say any of us were playing amazing golf, but we certainly weren't playing terrible golf. After six holes, I was only one stroke over par, and after seven holes, our entire car was actually within two strokes of each other. So needless to say, confidence was soaring through my veins, and the putt was feeling amazing that day. I'd already hit one circle two putt, drawn metal on two others, and made about a 28-footer to save par. I was happy to take pars, looking for birdies when available, but not really playing too aggressive at all. I guess if I'm being honest, I wasn't really asking a lot of myself that day, so it was going to be pretty hard to be disappointed unless I just had a crummy attitude, and that didn't really come until hole 13. Hole 13 is a chip forehand or turnover backhand. It's like 272 feet into a protected green. I got super excited because the holes are very long on this course, so anything about 350 feet and in, I knew I had to be aggressive on going for those birdies. I step up to throw this on a beautiful forehand and I slip on the tee box. As I'm falling, I yank it so far off to the left side of the fairway that even this guy couldn't have put it in the basket with his go-go gadget arms. I miss the entry into the green and the course is designed to punish you if you do exactly that. So it takes me two strokes to even get into the circle and bada boom bada bing, a birdie hole that I was thinking turns into a bogey and yeah, I was pretty salty about losing one of my birdie opportunities. But I tried to hold my head high. I realized at the end of the round that I made several big putts that I should be super proud of and when I had opportunities, I took them. Every single one of my bogeys came from a mental error, either misjudging distance or not being confident and selecting the right disc. Honestly, the goal was to not come in last place and after round one I wasn't even in triple digits in terms of my overall place so I hung out with a few friends and competitors afterwards because I knew I was heading back to a quiet house because my host and caddy was at the hospital getting his gallbladder removed and was still way more focused on me having a good time because Alan is just that great of a human being so we had a significantly earlier tee time for round two and local legend Taylor Conradi, who is a subscriber here to the channel, said that he'd be willing to caddy for me and film some shots during the second round. Honestly, my favorite part of going to events is getting to meet each and every one of you and hear your success stories out there on the course, including Jason and Greg, who followed our card on round one. Stepped up to hole one with a lot more confidence, a lot less nerves, ready to put it in the circle once again. And we did exactly that. And we also missed our putt because nerves on hole one are still a problem. Now my card on day two didn't have any big name pros on it, which lowered my nerves overall, but I also think it loosened me up a lot because it felt much more like a local event on a big course than a silver series at a disc golf pro tour. <laughs> Almost got that one. There was a lot more joking and banter on the second card, and I think that's because those of us on the card aren't viewing that competition as our livelihood, and that totally makes sense. The first card, those guys were at work, doing work because they need to win in order to make some money and get food on the table. Now, if we ever get the chance to play together, I hope you guys realize that I'm a pretty casual guy out here on the course. I like to laugh, have a good time, and throw some good golf. I'm a firm believer that you can enjoy yourself, not be too serious, and still play great golf. And in round to I played a much cleaner front nine and like I said I guess I felt a little too comfortable on my card because I got super sloppy on the back nine and I ended up scoring the same score as the day before and I don't know it just felt worse overall and I think that has to do with my weaknesses as a player being highlighted on a course like this and in the second round my strengths didn't really seem to compensate for those weaknesses at all which brought me to the first two takeaways of this event because round three was a special one that would teach me an entirely different lesson the first is that when comparing myself to people who are better than the average disc golfer, I do not throw far, like at all. Looking at my statistics after rounds one and two, I was not even top 100 in the field and reaching circle one or two in regulation. That means that while my opponents were putting for birdies and pars, I was putting for pars and bogey. And when that's the situation that you're facing, it makes it really difficult to score well against the field, much less win, no matter how good you are at putting. Which takes me to my second point, I'm really good at putting. I just need to get to the basket sooner. About the middle of last year, I connected with Mike Strauss, my coach, who's worked with plenty of touring pros before. And I told him that I wanted to start at the basket and work my way backwards. I felt like my putt was really good 25 feet and in, but I had no power getting from 25 feet out to about 45 or 60 feet. And that's what we did. We worked on my putt over and over again. Another helpful thing I found was Distot. Guys, I know that it sounds like a sales ad, but I truly cannot recommend Distot enough. Because these dots are so 
bright. I know immediately when I've thrown a good putt and it's hit the target area that I'm focusing on. So not only do my practice putts give me muscle memory, but also it gives me mental confidence knowing what a good putt really looks like because of disc dots. So if you want to check them out, head over to disc.usa.com and use code RCDiscGolf to save yourself a little bit of money. And I can personally promise you that not only are you going to save money, but you're going to save a ton of strokes out there. Because coming out of round two, I was not top 100 in the field when it came to getting into the circle. But through round two, once I found myself putting, I was actually top 30 in the entire field in my putting percentages. So talk about a surprise confidence booster from the event. So thank you, Mike, and thank you, Distot. You guys are the best, and I wouldn't be the putter that I am without you guys. And then there was round three. And it'd be tough to kind of, you know, describe round three. So I brought along this visual aid. Yeah, I can't even be on a disc golf course when I talk about round three because it just brings up a lot of emotional trauma. Okay, I think we're safe. My practice baskets can't see me. It's worth noting that heading into round three, the hero of our story, Alan, had returned. Yes, the legend who had just gotten his gallbladder taken out Friday night, a little after midnight. He's caddying for me on day three, and there's three thoughts that I'm thinking heading into the final round. One, we've played golf that we're pretty proud of all weekend long. Keep that up for the last few holes. Two, we haven't had any blow up holes yet, and the worst we've taken on at any hole in the entire course has been a bogey. We keep that streak alive, we're gonna feel great. And three, thank Thank the Lord for disc golf because the rounds we've been playing and the people we're meeting while playing these rounds have been pretty much the only bright spot of the last seven days. We step up to hole one and I'm trying to play with confidence all day because what do I have to lose? I'm not gonna win the event. I'm gonna try to get as many birdies as I possibly can and throw some more aggressive shot. Of course, I throw my shot on hole one and it felt the best of any tee shot that I threw the entire weekend and I didn't read the wind right. It drops down and finds itself just OB and boom, I'm throwing for three from a major distance and about to bogey hole one. Thankfully, my upshots have felt great all weekend and I'm able to put it under the basket for a carefree bogey. Now, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bummed that I took the bogey on hole one and I think I carried that with me to the next tee shot and because of that, I threw a pretty horrific one. I'm talking like real bad. The kind of plays that the course designer probably thought, no one's even gonna land over here. I step up and throw the forehand roller of my life, get to a pretty decent position, and then try my best to continue to climb up this super steep hill and throw it. I feel like it's a pretty great shot, only to have about an 89 foot look with a tight, tight window and no clear or comfortable putt. And it was at this point that I could sort of feel the walls closing in and life was trying to catch up to me. With frustration and disappointment building, I decided to run this putt as best I could and not I'll worry about the results happening if I missed it. <laughs> Was it a lucky putt? For sure. But did I also believe in my mechanics enough to give it a chance to go in? Absolutely. Life was not going to catch me this round. There was wind under my wings and I could absolutely feel the excitement carrying into the next tee shot. I proceed to throw a fantastic drive and I throw my second shot just about where I want it to be, maybe a little off to the right, leaving me with an upshot that I had practiced and thrown multiple times during the tournament. Unfortunately, I juiced it too much and my disc magically figured out how to not fall through trees, but sort of glide along the backside into a pretty much terrible spot for me to be. I was about 30 feet from the basket, but with a massive wall of trees standing in my way. And it took me two basically pitch outs just to get through all of it to even find the basket to give myself a chance for a putt. High moment of a big putt immediately followed by my first double bogey of the entire event. I spent holes four through seven really letting the game shift more from here and muscle memory into a mental battle that was exactly exhausting to try to overcome. Rather than just focusing on the game plan and enjoying the moment like I had done the entire rest of the weekend. And so I did it again. I took that frustration straight onto the tee box of hole 10 through an errant shot that got blown off of the island green. And then I stepped up to my up shot, tried to run it and ended up going OB again. So I take a five on a 200 and like 50 foot hole. I was trying to fight through this round and it was becoming
feeling so physically, mentally, emotionally just exhausting on so many levels. And life was just telling me, you thought disc golf was your friend, but we're about to show you otherwise. Let's just take as many pars as we can, ride this train out, soak up these last few moments, and we'll see you at the next one. And so thankfully, that's what we did. We were able to save par for a few holes in a row, make some pretty good putts, and give ourselves some opportunities until we got to hole 16. Forehand drives are actually a strength of my game, and hole 16 is just a flex forehand all the way down. I had parred it all weekend long with a look at the birdie every single day. I step up and throw my drive, and my card kind of like rallies me on, which shows you just what we were dealing with, because anytime I threw a decent shot, my card was like, yeah, Robbie, let's go. I tell my card that I think it's a good shot, but the last tree probably caught me and I'm in the middle of it. And sure enough, I was. I put my foot in the tree, mark my spot, lean out, and basically have this like toss up 50 foot run at the basket. A random volunteer starts walking by, staring at me like, are you gonna go? Am I gonna go? Finally, he walks away. Take a minute. Oh, nice. <laughs> And then came hole 17. I'm gonna need to take a seat for this. Throw my drive goes way out to the right and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I crushed that one. Oh no, please get back in bounds. Please get back in bounds. Can't tell if it got back in bounds. So I move about a hundred feet up the fairway to where it was last in bounds. Look at my card and say I'm throwing a provisional because there's a chance that this thing is in bounds. I grab another wraith, hang it out there. Da, 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 da. It never comes back in bounds. Ooh. Fairway slopes right to left. So I step up and I pull out an understable disc and go to throw it on a forehand. Tell myself this because I can flip it up to flat, let it ride straight. And if I turn it over, which is my miss, it's just going to match the slope of the hill, land softly and bada boom, bada bing. We're just going to be up there. Or so we thought. Throw my forehand. It goes to flat doing beautiful flight things. Slightly turns over and I think this is what we wanted. Then we're okay with this miss it hits bounces a little bit catches an edge and then cut rolls all the way across the fairway and it's ob i walk up to where that last disc rolled out of bounds and it is sitting right next to my initial drive, which is about three feet away from the OB line. The walls were no longer crashing in. Ah, that, that had already happened. We were drowning. We drop in for an 11. That is the most strokes over par I've ever been on a single hole. And uh, yeah, it's also more over par on a single hole than I was on either of my first two rounds. So at this point, what do you do? You got no fight left in you. And yeah, we take a five on the last hole. Really tough to not let those two holes sour the entire event. Which brings me to my third takeaway. I'm not as mentally strong as I thought I was, and I tried to fight all week long. The only way that we become mentally stronger is to find ourselves in situations to test that mental strength and mental resolve. And we certainly had the opportunity to do that at our first Disc Golf Pro Tour event. I am really grateful that I played, and I'm even more grateful for the music city community. Volunteers like Mitch and Ruthie are just incredible human beings who helped make this event so welcoming. So if you're like me right now and having a rough go at it, don't worry, I believe there's light on the other side, but I also think it's okay for us to just say, this is a bummer that we find ourselves here right now. I absolutely lived in the story of my round that last round, and it was awful to try and fight through. I didn't approach it shot by shot, and it definitely showed as the round went on. So overall thought, Thoughts on my first experience on the Disc Golf Road Tour. I loved it and I would definitely do it again in the future when I can throw much farther. It's not even that I want to be able to throw 550 foot shots. It's more so that on 350 foot shots, I wanna be throwing mid ranges and putters. My putting feels great, especially when I'm putting confident and that's what I wanna take into future events as well. You can't do anything when life hands you curveball after curveball after curveball. We're taking life on life's terms. But what we can do is know that we're not alone in it. So I wanna thank you for watching and thank you for following along for this recap. If it was remotely helpful or if you enjoyed seeing kind of the insides behind all of it, let me know and I'd be happy to do it for future big tournaments that I go and play. As always, I want to say thank you for watching and I hope you have an amazing rest of the week. But for now, I'm going to leave you with the bird.